So I'm heading out to see that random psychiatrist to get Zoplicone. I have to drive like an hour, well maybe 45 minutes, depending on traffic. Just to get there, because it's a different city where my psychiatrist was, and this temporary psychiatrist is, and I just need Zoplicone. And again, feeling grateful for these meds that just knock me out and slow me down. Tranquilize me so I don't feel like if I don't get into the other dimension now, I'm going to not make it. And yeah, so we'll see how that goes. I put some books in one of those neighborhood little book library things where you can take a book or leave a book and look what I found. I'm gonna read it and then put it back because it's kind of old but I think it shares some of her beginning story which might be kind of cute. And I caught this. And when I was at McDonald's drive-thru, which I go through like three times a year, if that, to get either a smoothie or coffee. And that only started happening in like the last two or three years. Before that, I never went. But I noticed that they have this machine that like turns the cups and then puts it along this little conveyor to pour the type of pop. And I used to work at McDonald's and, you know, we looked at the screen and grabbed the cup and put the thing there and, like, press the button for the right kind of pop, for all the pops. And I was just like, wow. Times have really changed, you know? Automation. We're all afraid that we're not going to have some kind of meaningless job to do. That's why I feel like next age or the age that we need to realize is the age of meaning because there's so much information there's so much technology there's so much automation that we need to find new meaning as human beings because being robots is being taken over by robots and there's no need to be afraid of that because there's a no there's another level of awakening where life is totally different but if we don't see that, if we've never seen it, then we're afraid. So I just got a prescription for Zoplicone and I learned that you're not really meant to take it for more than six weeks. And so it's a little bit interesting because I'm not going to California for 12 weeks. So somehow I got to get this sleeping thing back under wraps and maybe it will naturally. They did say I could take 100 milligrams of trazodone. Uh, I was doing that at some point, or maybe not. I can't remember. So there are ways I can try to sleep. I should try not to take the Zoplicone for more than three days. No, where, no matter where you go, there's like big noisy vehicles. It's so bad for the brain. But I'm in the park and uh, It's kind of strange to go between this natural world where there are no problems to the world of problems and problem solving. Solving the problem of sleep and solving the problem of getting a pill and solving the problem of going to pick up the pill from the pharmacy and getting my other prescription transferred from the pharmacy on the island and there's all these things to do. but. One can also just stand under a tree and enjoy the shade and the beeping trucks backing up. And I'm gonna go look at the rose garden. And then I have a few other problems to solve. I solve the problem of getting a nice little present for a child's birthday on Saturday. And
Maybe I'll try and find a quiet spot this, to sit in the sun. I'm in one town and there's gonna be traffic driving back to the other town, so I may as well maybe wait it out. If I went now, no, I saw there was traffic when I went before, when I was coming in, so more trucks. Stop and smell the roses. Mm. It's a very rosy rose. Can you see how shiny that is? Can you see that it's made of light? Can you see that? right there. It's so obvious. Can you see it? This is the reason I don't miss this city that I used to live in. Sirens everywhere. Table saws. Blah. Just this hub of noise. I don't think I want to stay here. I'd rather sit on the highway in traffic. So I've fixed a couple problems today and I've scheduled the fixing of a problem. That dentistry work I have that's not comfortable, it's all jagged. I made an appointment with another dentist for Wednesday next week. So hopefully then my mouth will feel feng shui and I want to make a blood donation appointment for before then if I can. So you have to wait a bit after having dentist work and I've stopped taking the aspirin so I can donate blood. So that's another thing I need to do and then at some point get the air conditioning fixed on my car and then I'll be good to go. But I'll probably stay here for a while. And just getting some sunshine. All the noisy things finally went away. And now I'm back to keeping track of things better in my iCal. Whenever I have something that I need to do at a certain time, or remember to do the next day or what have you, I put it in iCal and that's one of the ways I stay organized so I don't have to remember stuff. And of course everyone does that, or lots of people do, but I think it's even more important for someone who's diagnosed with bipolar because a lot of times we feel like we're in this timeless zone. We do still need to keep track of time. And so, when I went to get the Zoplicone prescription, they told me to call the clinician in two weeks just to check in, so put that in my calendar so I don't forget to call the clinician in two weeks. And I put in, go get the Zoplicone prescription filled tonight. And I might think, well, I don't need to do that because it's tonight, I'm not gonna forget. But as soon as I say, well, I will put this in and I won't put that in, then I have to start to wonder, did I put something in? Did I forget something? But if I do it every time, I don't have to worry about whether I did it or not. On rare occasion, I might forget, but for the most part, I can realize that my brain is externalized in my iCal. This is something I forgot to tell myself that I heard from my counselor when I was talking about silence or something. She was saying that science has shown that the brain or nervous system, I'm not sure exactly, can only, can only myelinate in silence. That's huge, and I haven't looked at the study or anything. 
And then if you extrapolate that to demyelination disorders or autoimmune, it could be partly caused by all the noise. And these things would be very hard to, to prove. And when I was waiting to go see the psychiatrist, something came to mind about how global climate change is partly due to sunscreen. Okay, now that's a giant leap, right? Giant leap. And that's not what I initially thought, but I realized that the sun is partly meant to be absorbed by the human skin to give us the benefits of vitamin D. And vitamin D affects something like 3,000 genes, or I don't know. So if we're, fle we're reflecting that back, we're not taking the gift from the sun. And not only that, that isn't be being absorbed and transferred and transmuted properly and metabolized properly. So it's a waste, it's wasted. And maybe some of that energy is reflected back towards the sun and then the sun it heats up more because it's not getting absorbed into things, it's getting reflected back. And I don't know if that's true, but you know, when you mess with nature, weird things happen. So it could say on sunscreen bottles, beware this product could beware this product could lead to global climate change now that seems stupid right but that's how far out my brain can think and that could be in a hypothesis that someone tests right but i don't have time to test all my brain's hypotheses nor the equipment or anything but I can see it. I can see these, these relationships. And I don't think about it, it just comes to mind. Something I'm finding lately, which might be quite obvious, is that being really kind and polite to people, no matter work, no matter what, works. And it's like, well, duh. But when, when somebody has a so-called mood disorder, it's easy to get into prolonged states of not feeling the greatest inside and then that kindness is harder to come by. But I'm finding lately, when I interact with someone, I'm just naturally more smiley. And it doesn't even feel like I'm trying to be kind or nice, it just happens. So there's a difference of feeling like in a bad mood and then being kind on purpose, but then there's just this movement of, wow, I'm relating to a human being right now, this is a miracle, without even thinking that. It's just, and I don't know if it'll continue, but it seems like a bit of a change, which could go away, but it's I'm, I'm noticing it. It's like being kind without a doer so maybe the kindness is doing it and the joy the state of joy not a self trying to be kind which is a subtle difference and that's the thing with this as all the differences are very subtle and they're hard to see one really needs to work at seeing these subtle differences and it makes all the difference even having that not the greatest day the other day and laying there remote viewing. Now I don't feel like, oh my gosh, the other day was so bad. It just, it's not even there. It doesn't even leave a mark. So it doesn't even matter. But it matters as much as like trying to sleep and knowing the importance of sleep. So probably on Saturday, I will try to sleep with less Zoplicone and more Trazodone or something. So yeah, I feel like my brain is more and more awake. Like I'm probably manic, but I don't feel manic. I don't feel excited, but I definitely am having trouble sleeping because I could be awake a lot more and feel like I don't need sleep and feel wide awake when I'm awake. But then eventually it does get to a point, even more quickly now than maybe in the beginning, that, that one gets sort of um, scared by the lack of sleep 
getting into a place where one could be crying and be like, oh my god, I have to sleep because one really knows the danger. It's not funny. It's not something to be played around with. So if I sleep, I can appear normal. I don't sleep. I start to freak out. And then knowing how to navigate that makes it less of a problem. And I probably keep saying this in many different ways what the trouble is. I totally forget. I don't really know what I've talked about. I kind of want freshy. So I might drive back soon. Even though it'll take a while. Last week I had way less focused breathing and way more tense. How far would one drive for a kombucha sometime? I really wanted one and yesterday or the day before, I forget. I got one at Freshie and it was like $6.50. So I decided next time I'm gonna go to Superstore and get my kombucha. And today was a pretty good day. Last night I had to take a sleeping pill and I did sleep from like 10.30 to 8.30. Tonight begins Operation Taper Off the Sleeping Pill because the psychiatrist said it's not meant to be taken for more than six weeks and I should only take it three nights in a row and then try to taper off. So it's not the answer. So I'm gonna up Trazodone and see if that helps me sleep because I'm feeling quite energized. When I was driving home just a few minutes ago, it was the first time I felt kind of like tiredness right in here. And then I realized it was partly because I was worrying about something that happened today that was like totally minor. It's nothing even worth worrying about. But I noticed as I was doing that, that is what was decreasing the energy. So going into any kind of worry that makes the self structure prominent or continuous. And um, yeah, so I might apply for skip the dishes because I like driving and now I have a fuel efficient car and it's like a temporary thing not sign up forever to do it so maybe I'll watch a video on it when I get home and see what people think of it or what the process is and yeah things have been good and I was having some realizations driving in to work today but can't remember what I realized, so it's not that important, but yeah, I'm feeling more lost, but also more found in that I'm able to be present in whatever situation I'm in, in relationship with whoever, and then just drive home and then just go to sleep, or I feel kind of like nothing, but I'm getting used to it. It's a strange feeling. And somebody I know was saying something about, oh, you should share what you say and stuff like that. I can't remember, I can't remember what they said. I'll, let me see. They said, you are really smart and somebody needs to write down your words for the evolution of mankind seriously. And then they were talking about something they watched of me talking, not my videos that I make to myself, but something else, and they said, like, I wanted to quote you, you describe the eye of the storm perfectly, blah, blah, blah. And 
this person I know, they're very truthful to the point where it's a little bit shocking at times. And I think that I've learned from them about if you tell the truth, it'll be okay. I don't want to say that's a general rule, but it's at least more powerful than not telling the truth. So this thing I wrote lately was really vulnerable and personal, even though I don't, I'm sort of going through this process where I don't feel like a person at all. So it's this weird, bizarre thing where I'm speaking more personally, but I actually feel less of a person. And I'm seeing in the moments of being alone, when the self wants to come in and grab hold of something, it's like wanting attention. It's wanting to like create a scenario for attention as opposed to being in the moment with whatever's happening but not purposefully being any way in particular. So it's really subtle and I don't really understand. But I'm at the park and I'm gonna go home and it'll be too cold there and hmm. yeah so I'm feeling I think it's a strength even if it's temporary because I don't know a strength of not needing attachment I'm not sure if that's what it is. So in the past, in these times of fear, I'd want to reattach to that which I'm attached to in order to feel comfortable, like I'm not alone. And so now I'm seeing that and I'm seeing that that is more uncomfortable than this aloneness that can, that can feel a little bit like aloofness. But in, it's not aloofness. What I feel that it is, is that one is coming to a sense of loving oneself more than the need to act in an attached way to others who are attached to me in order for them to feel good. Even though it doesn't feel good for them, at least they feel like they're in some sort of interaction with me. And I'm just like, no, I don't want to interact. That is not love. That's no. And so it feels a little bit like an aloofness to those who would. Yeah, I don't know. And then somebody told me a story about when they went into a really creative space and they've never been diagnosed with anything. And three different people came up with them to them in a row, but at different times. And like the first one said something sort of scary and then the next one said something more positive and then the next one said something even more positive. So it was weird because I'm not going to tell the story because it's not mine to tell, but it reminded me, it reminds me of when one goes into this space where one has this sense that one knows something that other people need to know. And it feels like, oh my gosh. <gasps> And then all of a sudden at some point people start to sort of have this negative energy towards you and then they start sort of attacking you and one gets this energy of feeling paranoid that one is being chased or or you know spied on by the CIA or something but really I feel that is a phenomenon that can happen when one has a sense of wow, there's so much that we can have access to that we're not accessing and I need to communicate that somehow. But then one feels the menace of society that would not want that. They want it to stay the same. And there are others that come in and sort of test whether we're scared or not. And that happens with psychiatry not that they're trying to scare us, but a lot of times when we're in the psych ward, we're going through scary stuff. And we haven't had the strength yet to go through it on our own and say, no, I'm not gonna reattach to this system. It's not gonna scare me away from that which I understand. And it's hard to get to that point. And maybe there are people that get 
to that point and don't go through the scary stuff of psychiatry. They understand. It's really hard to describe, but, and I'm not saying it will continue, but it feels like I understand that there is a value, or I have a value, not me, but a human being has value, even if they're sitting in a park staring at the trees, even if they're sitting on a street corner asking for money. Everybody has value. There's no such thing as this false value system that humanity has created, and it's that which is causing the pain. And the most sacred thing in the world is the human relationship without this hierarchy and value system that is completely false. You know, imagine people that get a mental illness label feeling like, wow, I have a real value in this world. I have a real function. Even if I don't do anything, I have value. Instead of get back at it, snap out of it, get back to it, why aren't you doing anything, you're lazy, all these things. It's not true. So I'm finding myself being a lot more kind in human interaction, but then I'm also finding myself being kind to myself in knowing that I have value. So, you know, imagine a scenario where you're in a family and you're one of a number of siblings and you're the one with a mental illness and you don't have your shit together. And yeah, imagine the energy coming from family members or parents or whoever towards that person like it'd be like you're not as good you're not good enough you're not doing as much you're not you don't have kids you don't have a full-time job you don't have a house you don't have um, a bank account with a lot of money in it and I'm like wow it doesn't matter I see my own value and I don't need anyone else to see it and that is the freedom and I don't know if it'll last, but that's the thing. What I talk about with myself doesn't generally last. So if I don't talk about it when I'm sensing it, I won't talk about it because it's sort of a momentary thing. So what I'm trying to say to people out there who have been labeled, know your own value and see it not from the point of I'm the greatest and you're not, because that's the same as what w is being done to us. So know you have value and find it and share it and live it and be it. And if you forget sometimes and go into fear or anger, don't worry about it. Don't carry that forward. Let it be and forget about it and move on to being who you are. We know from experience, if say we have a bipolar label, we can all of a sudden be the shiniest version of ourself in an instant. It doesn't take time or practice. It's there. It's possible. And it's a matter of just touching into that. And we can touch into it any time. And even if we're not touched into it, we can't. It's still there. It's still available. But we have to be okay with being alone because if we're not, then we try to manipulate in order to get attention. When we don't want attention, we are that state of attention. So it's a bit of a different way of looking. And again, I'm not saying I'm going to be able to uphold this continuously. The whole point of this is that there is no continuous entity there. So, remembering even the previous instant of how one was is trying to compare oneself to the last moment when there's no such thing as a continuous entity that can be the same. So comparing it to see if there's a sameness or a continuity is a waste of energy. 
but one can notice the mechanisms taking place. So when one doesn't feel like the shiny version, one can notice the mechanisms that are going on inside that are leading to that. And it's not a matter of trying to change the mechanisms to boost oneself up, it's just noticing the mechanisms and then they might kind of stop because one sees what they're doing. So I saw the mechanism of worry and how it was lowering energy and then I was like, whoa. And so it stopped and then I noticed the energy was back. So those subtle noticings we can do and there's nothing we have to do, just pay attention. Be that state of attention. And I was, something came to mind about that energy and it wants to be shared or it wants to light up other people. Make other people lighter. And then when one sees that one is that light, one feels that one doesn't need anything so that's why lately I feel less of a need to try to do anything to fix myself or improve myself in any way, including diet. But eventually I, I feel like I'll find a healthier routine, but material doesn't seem to really be fundamental. Well, it's not. Yeah, so I don't know if there's a strange concern about the possible seeing of aloofness and also the fact that I'm on a bunch of medications means I'm definitely not entirely stable, but I'm not trying to be stable per se. I do feel tired, which is good, because I haven't felt tired in a long time. So a person who saw something I shared about the process of suicide, not it actually happening, but being under the power of the possibility of it happening. I don't remember what I said, but they said something about, you perfectly articulated the eye of the storm, your description tapped into the emotional field, and it was a really fun ride to listen to it. And they said something, you said something about how when you're suicidal, it isn't you that's moving towards the act. There was a power to the way you said it that reminded me of my moments in that space and the truth of it. And in that truth rests a deep peace. And for everyone who understands, because they've been there, that leaves us a respite from the pathologization and hopelessness dispensed. So, I don't know. Maybe that's a sign that some of the stuff I said or have said is helpful. I might try to see that video. We'll see.